I'm Jay Stanley from the ACLU. I'm sort of emceeing this, and it's not going to be a debate or anything. I, 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 was, I was thinking that it would be a debate maybe between, or a discussion between um, Ross and everybody else here. Um, so uh, Dr. Ross McNutt is president of Persistent Surveillance Solutions, which describes itself as the developer and provider of a new generation of affordable airborne and ground-based area surveillance systems and services. Um, and you know, from the beginning of when drones became a hot topic about two or three years ago, you know, our biggest concern with drones has always been sort of mass surveillance and location tracking. And I wrote a blog post about uh, Dayton, Ohio's um, considering using a, this system. And then when I was at the uh, Airborne Law Enforcement Association Conference in Orlando, which uh, is sort of like police helicopter pilots, and uh, I was down there to talk about drones, and the head drone person in the FAA was down there. and one guy showed up for our panel on drones mm -hmm. because these are police helicopter pilots. They didn't want to hear a thing about drones because they saw job threats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I was at the expo and I saw Dr. McNutt giving his talk and he spied my ACLU tag and uh, he, he, you know, he approached me and said, can we meet? And we, after trading emails for a while, he sat down and he gave me a version of this presentation. And you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a hell of a presentation. And, um, you know, um, say what you will. Um, you know, we've had a big issues with transparency around law enforcement technology, like stingrays. It's like pulling teeth to try and get uh, law enforcement often to even release information about the technological capabilities and uses of their technologies. We think it's legitimate for law enforcement to keep things confidential in particular investigations, but the large scale decisions about what technologies and what powers law enforcement has is something that should be up to the democratic system. Um, say what you will. Um, Ross has been very open about what he's doing, and he's happy that he's he's, he's graciously come here into the into the heart of uh, into the belly of the beast to uh, to, uh, to 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 bravely uh, uh, present. So uh, please give him a warm welcome, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you. Today. What Jay didn't say is in that first article he wrote, he said our worst nightmares are coming true, and that's uh, <laughs> I'll go into that a little bit. Well, I'm Ross McNutt, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we've been working on privacy policies and other issues for about the last four years, trying to make sure that we get things right. And part of what that is is reaching out to various groups and, and showing them what we do. We believe in being absolutely open. I will answer any questions that you may have. I'll show you whatever data that we may have, and I'll give you some examples. Um, I'm just going to start just super quickly by showing you the scope and size of what we do. So we take airborne surveillance of cities. We can watch a 25 square mile area at resolutions we can just barely see people. People are one dot and what that allows us to do, this is basically half of Dayton, Ohio here at once. What that allows us to do is go in on the report of a crime, go in and figure out what information we may have that may help solve that. And so I'll walk through that sort of process. I'm going to give you an overview of what it is. I'm going to start with the overview of a customer need. I'm going to go in and I'm going to give you an example of an investigation. It's one of 34 murders we've witnessed so far. And uh, basically show you what we can see, what we can't see. Then I'm going to go into what we've been doing on the privacy policy sides, trying to make sure that we have an open discussion uh, as to the pluses and minuses of the system, the costs and the impacts, and basically be able to flesh that out so that various communities can make an informed decision as to whether or not they're interested in going forward with this type of system. And it's really up, our view is it's really up to the communities to make that decision based on their crime in their community, and their values, and what they want to do. And again, I'll show you all that as we go but again, oh, just like Google Earth, you can zoom in, but what we do is essentially a live updated Google Earth every second. Processed, downlinked, and distributed live. So with that in mind, into the infamous briefing. And don't worry, it's not that long a brief. So is that in focus? <laughs> I guess it is an in-focus one here, but 
Hi. I'm here actually to request your help. And I went to see Jay to request his help. And I've met with the Ohio ACLU and the Occupy Dayton group and a whole bunch of other people to basically ask for their help in getting their input as to what we're doing, how we're doing it, the protections we have in place. So I just want to say that I do have a sign-up sheet here that if you're interested in providing feedback and comments and other stuff, I'd ask you to sign up on that. I will send you out periodic emails as to what we're doing and which direction we're going because I do want the input, I want the communication, and we'll go from there. But we are, I'll get into some of this other stuff, but essentially our company is there to support law enforcement organizations and communities with their troubled areas. And we're trying to, again, get it right on the privacy and the public policy sides. My background is I have a PhD in technology management and policy. I've studied a lot about it. We're trying to do this process in the right way. I'm going to talk a little bit about the city's unmet needs, what the wide area surveillance is, give you a murder or two, and then basically jump into the privacy policies. Users' unmet needs. I just use Dayton, Ohio as an example. It's not to beat up on Dayton, it's just Dayton happens to have a significant amount of crime, as do most of our cities. Here's the crime over a course of a year in Dayton, Ohio. 28,000 crimes a year, 10,000 part one crimes. And the impact of that is pretty significant. When you get down to the street level, it's about every fourth house every year. Anybody want to live in Dayton? And that's the problem we run into. When you get out there and look at the Neighborhood Scout, Neighborhood Scout is basically a real estate website that rates neighborhoods. It rates Dayton a three out of 100. Mm -hmm. um, again, about 10,000 part one crimes, which are violent or significant property crimes. <laughs> you get in there, about one in 15 people every year, about one in four families every year are victims of crime. Cost of crime for Dayton, Ohio, if you just take the National Institute of Justice's cost per crime times the number of crimes in Dayton a year, the impact on the Dayton community is $480 million a year. And that's just roughly $3,400 for every man, woman, and child in the city. These are the situations that we're fighting here. Dayton, 28,000 overall crimes per year, 70 to 80 per day. 10,000 part one crimes per year, about 25 to 30 a day. And that's the, that's the significant social problem that we're trying to work on solving. And about 86% of property crimes go unsolved, which is typical of most cities. Um, one of the things that results in is lower house prices. Dayton, Ohio, the average house price is about $57,000 a year and dropping at about three to 4% per year. In Centerville, the town two miles away, average house price is $158,000 a year for the same size house. And that's because the crime in the schools and the job market and other things. Do you own any property in Dayton? Yes, I do. Here's the daytime crimes over a one month period in Dayton with our covered areas. So that's really what we're fighting and trying to get to when you get into it, cost per, crimes per square mile Dayton has 172 crimes per square mile per year, which lo and behold only puts it about halfway up the U.S. market for major cities. Chicago has got 675 crimes per square mile. Baltimore's 419 crimes per square mile. And we look at it on a crime density standard uh, because that actually should, gives you an indication of how many crimes we'll see on a given six hour mission. What is wide area surveillance? Well, we watch major parts of cities at once. This is an image from about seven years ago, but the key is that we take an 88 million pixel image in this case, and we've moved to 192 million pixels, that allows us to go into that little football field there, and live or after the fact, come into the point where we can actually see the people on the field. And our objective is to find people from a crime scene follow them to the car that they get into and follow the cars to and from the crime scene to figure out where they came from and where they went to. Here's an example. This is Compton, California. Again, the nice thing is that for us, anywhere within that whole image, 
we can zoom in here, we can zoom in here, and we can zoom in here live or after the fact to basically provide that information that otherwise wouldn't be available to help solve the problems. How do we do that? I'm going to give you a quick example of a murder investigation. We spent a lot of time south of the border. This is actually the second murder on the first hour of the first full day of operations in Juarez, Mexico. Just prior to this was the execution of a female police officer about 20 minutes prior. What we do is we go into our incident locator so we get all the police reports. These are just the crimes that were within our coverage area during the time that we were flying that day. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go and investigate all of them because frankly, there we, at one point, we were doing 10 murder investigations at once and I only had 10 analysts. So we actually stopped flying. Here's, uh, this is, <laughs> again, our first days, full days on the job, the execution of a female police officer. We started flying at one o'clock that day, so 10 minutes into it, we see one execution, 45 minutes, or but an hour, about 40 minutes later, we see another one. And oh, by the way, we were pretty busy after that also. i give you a sense of what it is. Here's one murder down here. This was the female police officer, and this was a cartel on cartel killing. And I'll give you a sense of what that is inside the data here in just a second. The images I'm going to show you, this is actually what a shooting looks like. This is your shooter here. This is your victim. And you can actually see the guy doubling over there. And in just a second, I'm going to jump into the other one and show you essentially him running to his car and getting into it. We're able to follow the guys for 45 minutes prior to the murder and three and a half hours after the murder and basically tell you just about everything that goes on with them. So right here, I'm going to start just a couple of minutes prior to the murder. What you see here is three cars in their last pre-murder meeting. And they're going to come down to kill a guy right down here in just a minute. You actually have a fourth car down here who appears to be the guy who's paying for the murder. He met with the cars that are doing the murder about 10 minutes prior. He's going to hang off about two blocks while the murder occurs. Speed this up just a little bit. So here is a protection car here. This is your shooter on foot. The yellow car is another protection car and the orange car here is actually your getaway car. And again, we weren't told about this murder for quite a while afterwards because we were investigating the female police officer that happened about a half hour prior. Matter of fact, the entire police report on this murder said man found in an alley shot, no witnesses. So here's your shooter right there. He steps back. Right there is the shot. And you'll see him run off and he's going to get into the second car there and drive off. Interestingly, here are all your no witnesses. Mm -hmm. So they're running out here and it turns out they run towards the victim then they run down the alleyway after the shooter. That tells us they're armed. Not only that, but they have some responsibility for security. So essentially what it turns out is this is actually a drug gang that's waiting for a delivery that's going to show up here in about 10 minutes. Now this time, here's your shooting here. Shooter runs off, gets into that car, and drives off. Now unlike any other type of system, we're going to be able to jump over and literally watch that car and see where he goes. Notice the yellow car on the wrong side of the road, swerving inside, outside, running the red light. This guy cuts people off. For some reason, after you kill somebody, traffic laws don't apply to you. So you come up here. Right here, you're actually going to see a guy get out of the car. See the guy get out of the car right there? He's going to walk right into this second house there. This is actually the second car from there. See the guy here? he's going to walk right into that notch. And what we do, provided my internet's still working, ah, come on. 
is we're going to come over here into Google Earth and let's see if it's going to give me, there you go, the front door picture of the house that the guy goes into. That's what we're going to feed the law enforcement. Sorry about the flickering there. I think that's because I don't have my, ac my current internet access. How much of the tracking is automated versus like This is all manually tracked. So the, the analyst is actually going to come through, and just to give you a sense here, here are the tracks of just the primary people involved in this murder and what we did to track it. And what I can do is come in here and say, all right, give me a track report. And we can say, all right, here's what, exactly what this car did on a second-by-second -second basis. Here's where this car met with another car a half hour prior to the murder. Here's where that same car met with the same another car a half hour prior to the murder. Here's where this car met with that same car right outside the murder scene 15 minutes prior to the murder. So you literally can put together a turn-by-turn -turn thing for the suspects involved in major crimes. Do you know it's the same car because you back up and follow it? We've Do tracked him on a second-by-second -second basis okay. throughout the whole image. And again, we tracked these guys for 45 minutes prior to the murder, three and a half hours after the murder. So it's a sort of automation of circumstantial evidence? It is a step-by-step -step analyst going through on a second-by-second -second basis tracking the car from where he came from to where he goes to. Yes, sir? Are you using heat signatures? Are you using photos? It's just, an, it's, just an elect, it's just a photograph. It's just a photograph. Yeah, it's just EO imagery. This is black and white because that's an older system. I typically show data from Mexico because it's a little less threatening. Than, but we also have similar stuff in Compton and Baltimore and Philadelphia. It's all photos. Yeah, it's all photos. And we're really only tracking people. You saw what the people look like. That's the best resolution I can do. That's also the best resolution I want. Because nothing will piss you off more is that when you see the murder occur and the guy leaves your image before you figure out where he went to. And that's why instead people often say, well, the technology is going to get bit better. You're going to be able to have 10 billion pixels well, if I had 10 billion pixels, I'd rather watch all of Dayton at once than watch part of Dayton because I'm more likely to get the guy to the house that he goes to, which is really the information we're providing. Where he came from, where he went to, who he met with, where those guys came from, and where they went to. Yes? Do you correlate with other sensors, like there's traffic cameras? And we, do with, we do with ground-based cameras, and this gets into areas... One of the things we found is that ground-based sensors suck. They don't solve hardly any crimes whatsoever because what happens is you see the crime in them and the person leaves and they're gone. If they happen to get a good enough description to get a color of a coat, they're doing pretty well. You can't usually get facial descriptions and other sorts of things. Mostly to get license plates on cars. And right. Do the car was right. One of the things I'll point out here is these are all the ground-based cameras in Juarez. There's 275 of them. And what we do is we can tell you the exact second that nine vehicles passed this camera. We can also show you the time that they passed this camera. We can also show you the time that they passed this camera. So that's really what we do is we actually bring a lot more benefit to the systems that are on the ground. Some people ask, can you read license plates from where our angle? No. Even if I had 100 times the number of pixels, I couldn't read a license plate the other thing is I'm looking down on a car, not sideways, so I, even if I had the pixels, I couldn't read it. So, one thing I will the point the out... The basis are, is it satellite? Air, these are aircraft-based systems. Yeah. So we're flying manned aircraft around a city for six to eight hours at a time. And I just want to point out that some of the guys that we follow are not the best people, obviously. Um, that was one of the murders that we followed these idiots to before they went and got these guys this is what upsets you though here is the second murder we followed the same this same group to before they went in and captured so that's the sort of thing that we're dealing with on a fairly regular basis and uh so so this isn't 24 7 it sounds like it's like a few hours later or something we do about five to six hours of mission 
And so we watch a city. Where we pick and where we watch is based on crime patterns, high crime areas, known crime. You know, if we've got a robbery set up that's going on in this area, we'll go watch that particularly. But to be honest with you, with most of the major cities in the U.S., we'll see 10 to 20 crimes of mission. And then the question comes into, we don't have the resources to investigate all of them. Which ones do you want us to investigate? Down in Juarez, we didn't even have time to look for kidnappings. It wasn't until three, four months afterwards when we were doing training on more analysts that someone said, what's the word for kidnapping? He didn't even know. And it turns out we captured one of the kidnappings and we were later hired by the dad to watch the money change hands to make sure the kid was released. And we didn't even think to look. How do you get a mission? Is like the police ask you to do we, we get hired by a city. Okay. And basically they say, watch, you know, Usually, to be honest with you, it's like pick an area and watch it. <coughs> yes, sir. So the technical aspects of the photography. Mm -hmm. These are uh, very high speed still shots. They are. Uh, we motion and, you know. we build our own cameras. So we have. Uh, we basically take a series of industrial imaging cameras using commercial off the shelf lenses flying on an airplane with a whole bunch of software that we wrote that ortho rectifies in real time. So it's 192 million pixels processed in about three to five seconds and downlinks so they're available. What's, what's, shut, what's the shutter speed? Uh, about a thousandth of a second. Which at that distance is, is enough to eliminate the motion. Yeah, and then we do the whole ortho rectification and everything else that we have to do. So it's a new generation of systems. The entire cost of the entire system, aircraft, camera system, data lakes, processors, storage, user stations, mobile command center, is less than the price of a single blue cell. How long are you keeping the video? What's that? How long do you keep the video? We are, our policy is one, we work very closely with the communities that we support, and we are put on contract with privacy policies and things that specify exactly that. And typically it's less than 45 days, often it's 14 days. So what we do is we work with our customer. One of the problems you run into is that they want you to keep the data that has potential crimes in it. If you're seeing 10 to 20 to 30 crimes a day, how do you figure out which data to get rid of? Does that make sense? What's the volume of data? We do about 1.3 to 1.5 terabytes a mission, about a five hour mission. Wait, five sir, six. Are you asked to video things that were there anticipating crime? Well, because we watch such a large area, in a one hour, one day mission over Dayton, we'll see eight to 10 to 15 crimes. And that's just based on statistics of Dayton, which, oh, by the way, has a, roughly a third the crime rate is Baltimore, Indianapolis, an eighth the crime rate of Chicago. Have you ever caught any kind of like kind of political protesting, kind of rioting? We've kind of never, I mean, to be honest with you, we're, we're more interested in the armed robberies, the shootings, and that sort of stuff. We, to be honest with you, it's hard to track an individual through a crowd. It's not something we do. We have we do parking lot efforts, so we'll go to a NASCAR race where they got 180,000 people. We'll help park cars because if we can park the cars in three hours instead of four hours, and they all buy one additional soda, the track will make an extra 250,000 bucks. Yes, ma'am. So the police departments want to see the footage itself. I would assume. What we typically do is our analyst will put together, we'll be told when and where a crime occurred, so we'll be listening to the dispatch. So it all starts with a 911 call. Someone calls in and says so-and-so's been shot. First of all, it's about a minute and a half after the event occurred. Then it takes about a minute for the person to explain to the operator, one, what happened, two, where it happened. Then it takes another 30 seconds to a minute or so for the operator to get on the dispatch and get it out to the police. So we start off about three minutes after the event occurred. We back up time, go look at that location, see if we can see people running away, follow those people and figure out where they go. We try to pull them over before they leave the images and we've actually done that. We've actually pulled people over before they left the area where we had them tracked from the house with the stolen goods. The officers went back, got the witness, pulled the witness up there and said, that's the guy, that's the truck. And we sort of joke that now not even our Montgomery County prosecutor can screw that one up. But the local reporter challenged that and said, yeah, give him a chance. I'm just trying to figure out, if you're, if you're getting 8 to 10 crimes a day on this footage, I would assume that the police firms would want to keep that footage of crimes for evidence. And would, therefore, they're getting all of your footage. 
they will we we basically maintain the footage we will what our analysts will do is they'll put together an entire briefing that shows where the people that are suspect of committing the crime came from where they went to every person they met with on the way to the crime and every place they stopped on the way from the crime where they're at and essentially all the information that we can provide them and again in that murder case there uh, and whereas only about five percent of the murders are ever solved the entire police report the entire investigation was man found in an alley shot no witnesses and your report is what was introduced into evidence not yeah the well they used our report along with the second murder when they captured the folks they separated them and they went in and said tell me everything you know about this murder so the police never see what you they never have possession of um, this footage. they never see it i'm just trying they, to figure out they could have access to it but typically they're not trained and they don't they we will show them essentially here's what happened but we we can train them it's not that it's not that difficult to be honest with you we took a group of sixth graders and at about 20 minutes taught them how to track and they tracked their first murders by the 45 minute point so Ross, yes, I would actually slightly speak something to your point I think what's happened here is they the police aren't using this to um, produce evidence in court of somebody's guilt. What they're doing is they're using this to create a suspect pool or to create an individual suspect. So that's why they don't need the evidentiary basis, which is really coming back to what I wanted to say the second point. Um, I think you speak about privacy mm -hmm. and uh, you know, oh, we can't see the face as though that's the answer to um, any potential problems with this type of security investment. Mm -hmm. uh, privacy is a very narrow domain and it's a very micro way of dealing with it. The macro um, perspective on this would be that you're doing something uh, in a specific area, which is a high crime area, you wouldn't be doing it if it weren't, which is already one of the most socially disadvantaged and disconnected areas, just by its nature, it's bound to be. And so, and what you're doing is a militarization of that urban space, because this technology and this approach is directly imported from Afghanistan and Iraq. I built the original systems. Okay, so at a wider societal level, don't you think that there's some concern to be had around the idea that you take a disadvantaged area that already feels completely separate to the rest of the society around it, mm -hmm. and you, you further uh, segregate and undermine a fractional of societal coherence by making that the most surveyed spot. And all you have to do to be a suspect is to be running away from a particular location at a particular time. Doesn't that literally feed or every yeah. single perception that those communities have of how they are observed or how they are controlled? Or potential witness. Or and so the other aspect that, uh, just to answer that real quickly, one, we don't focus on a neighborhood. We focus on half a city. Yeah, but it's got a, half. You got, you're, well, not, you're not doing it in the suburbs, are you? Well, you saw Dayton. Well, are you? The, the poor side of Dayton, the, the suburbs of Dayton isn't Dayton. Okay, so are you? Focused. But you're not doing it in the suburbs. Well, I mean, you, this is this is specifically right. in high crime, you know, design, urban yes. areas where the people are already the most um, victimized groups anyway. And now we they're just also the ones. More. They're also the ones that need the most support. Mm -hmm. We are responding to reported crimes where someone has picked up the phone and said, Johnny's been shot on the corner, or my house was robbed, or my car is gone. So we're responding to requests for service, because otherwise, if your house was broken into, and your stuff's missing, and you don't call 911, I have no clue. We have no way of looking at that, nor, I mean, why, how would we even know about it? The 28,000 crimes in Dayton are the ones that people called in. And ask for help, and that's why. So we're only help. We're helping the people that are asking for support. Does that make sense? Um, it makes sense, but I don't find it credible. Okay. I think this is a techno, a technology solution to a social problem, and I don't think it's. I mean, I totally understand why police would need support uh, and facilitation, but um, I mean, maybe I'm the only one who thinks this. But there's something kind of worrying about this idea of surveying this group of people over and above everybody else and, and, and as, as as you know as you were saying that you're creating a suspect pool and i think that's I, I don't think i think it's really undermining the kind of notion that you might put in place other societal um solutions rather than just more militarization of an urban space this may not be forever but some communities that have huge crime rates 
that are calling and asking for support. Dayton, Ohio, again, they didn't have all the information, but they were asking an online poll, you know, do you support the area, the proposal for aerial surveillance, or do you think it's an invasion of privacy? 62% of the people said yes, they support it. Now, that's an online poll. It's not very scientific. Yeah, no, but it's that's, not very scientific. I, 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 understand. I understand that, but, you know, that yeah, was, that's, that's what came up there. We didn't engage the community. And uh, well, we did actually engage the community, and when the mayor's poll actually shows that they are, that the community is in support is supportive of that. So let me uh, let me just skip forward here because I showed you some of that. What we do is we put together the briefings. This is some of the work that the analysts do, and they basically show you the path of the people prior to and after the murders. They show you where all they come from, where they go to. They document it. They uh, highlight the houses. They give you the front door picture to make sure we get the right house. And that really is, again, in this case, the previous, the investigation was man found in an alley shot, no witnesses. Has crime gone down in these areas? Uh, it went from 3,500 murders a year to about 1,500. Do you remove over what time Which still sucks, by oh, the way. Over what time period? Uh, that was at about a year and a half. We were only there for about four months. And then we got caught up in some political issues between the governor and the mayor over there. And there's, there's a lot of issues that can go on. Are there um, any crimes you can identify just from the overhead footage? No, we need to get cued. I mean, the chances of you looking down on a city and seeing a crime is so remote. It's almost as remote as seeing it with a police helicopter or a predator drone. The chances of seeing a crime that you don't know is going to occur with a predator or a police helicopter is darn near zero. Is it possible for me to opt out of the system? <laughs> don't commit a crime. Same don't be at the site of a crime scene. Well, that's actually more to the point, isn't it? It's not, he doesn't have to have committed a crime. All he has to do is be in the vicinity of a crime scene. But that he becomes yeah. part of the suspect. But that doesn't convict him. It just says these are the people that were there. It might be a witness. We've actually done a very good job, I think, of identifying witnesses and separating a witness from a suspect. There was one time a, there was a shooting right in the middle of the street. There was a car 25 feet back that was right there as a shooting occurred in front of him. And then we followed the, that car forward. He goes up five blocks, turns into his driveway. We follow him back. He goes to the grocery store. From the grocery store, he drives back to his house. He's 25 feet away from the shooting. He, anyone seeing it would have said, hey, I saw this car. He may have become a suspect. But because he wasn't the one who drove off like a bat out of hell and like an idiot, he basically pulls into his driveway. We've identified him most likely as a, sus as a witness where the other car that was near there who drove off at 80 miles an hour down the residential streets was seen as more likely the suspect. So it can have that that other information that says, you know, we're not sus we don't think you're a suspect based on the fact that you didn't behave like a typical suspect afterwards. So it might help in some of those cases. Do you share the data with anyone? What's that? Do you share the data with anyone? We share them with attorneys, both defense and prosecuting attorneys. Do you sell it so, to anyone? What? Do you sell it? Uh, it depends on what purpose we're up there for. If we're doing a traffic study, yeah, I mean, it belongs to the NASCAR race. So they're trying to figure out how to park cars. Better. What do you sell it to DHS or the government? We've done work for DHS on the border. So it, it really depends on who's paying us. Like the like Mexican police? Like the Mexican police. So they said, well, we didn't share it with the Mexican police because our customer didn't trust his own police force. So could I buy data from you? What? Could I buy data from you? Unless you know, if you added some reason we could go collect it, but it depends on what okay, you want. Reason? You're, you're, the data you have is not personally identified, right? I mean, you don't you don't have any way of turning the shadowy little figure running down the street into an identified person. Only based on location. Have you ever been asked off, asked to do a job that you found too morally repugnant to take on? Uh, we've had been approached by some investigators, but it's not really what we do. I mean. We just, I mean, we're into city side surveillance. We won't go out and watch. I think we were asked about a workman's comp type stuff by somebody. And we said, oh, yeah. Have you ever done a wealthy neighborhood? What? Have you ever done a wealthy neighborhood, a wealthy part of the city? Uh, we were asked by some guys in Scottsdale if we could set up one of our ground based cameras to watch it because they had a crime ring going on in the neighborhood. So, what kinds of, is, you, so you have the, the manned aircraft as well as ground based? What do we have? You? Those are the two main systems. We have. We basically take the same system and put it up on top of a mountaintop, and we can watch a good part of the city that way. 
It's the same, but it's roughly the same, same general technology. Here's just an example of a three robberies. This guy robbed this place, robbed this place. The guy matched the same description. They're 10 minutes apart. We found the one vehicle that tied the two places together. He comes up, and later that night, the family dollar was robbed. So we actually had the guy drive by the family dollar, stake it out. We tracked him backwards. For some reason, a lot of perpetrators want to put $5 of gas in their car. So we've got him putting $5 of gas in his car at the Clark gas station. We've got him paying the clerk the $5 there. We've got a description of the car. We've got the, the description, and we know where he came from and who went to, and the police were able to solve that one. Can you uh, see inside the skylights? No. <clears throat> I, the only way I know that you're not a bush is because you're moving. The only way I know that you're probably not a dog is that you got in the passenger side or the, the driver's side of the vehicle and drove off. So I can't, I mean, you're a dot. And again, if I had if I had five dot, four dots on you, if I had four times the resolution, you'd be four dots, I still couldn't tell. Well, I guess more what I'm getting at is let's say that I have a building which by traditional measures would be considered a private space even though it doesn't have a roof, like an atrium, mm -hmm. but you can see inside of it from over this, so is the expectation of privacy different? I can't really tell that you're there. I mean, typically what we're looking for, mostly what we're doing is following vehicles on public roads. Yes, so I, I, I'm thinking, I, at first I was thinking before you started about the, there was a recent uh, case uh, with Google Street View where some mechanic saw that uh, Google Street View was coming down, so they ran out, uh, one laid on the ground, the other one, you know, held a, uh, a wrench over his head, and then there was a big investigation because they thought it was Google Street View and the murder. Uh, I don't think that's as obvious or, or, or likely a scenario with you because you we always wave, We always wait for the good word. We get behind the guy, <laughs> they see us for about yeah. a half mile. Or so, or because you get reports of actual crime, but I am thinking about as, as criminals maybe potentially realize that you may be in the air, so now they, they know to drive outside of your uh, viewpoint, or they train their dog to jump in the passenger seat and jump out somewhere. <laughs> um, you know. yeah, well, our police chief, to be honest with you, would very much like to bring in all the at-risk youth, bring in all the people on probation, and say, look, guys, you know, the, the, we, he, the goal here isn't, I mean, one, it's to solve crime. Two, it's to provide a credible deterrent. Sure. Deterrence is, one, the probability of getting caught. The swiftness of getting caught, and, the, and finally, but least impactful, is the punishment associated with it. And what he wants to do is bring him in and say, "Look, guys, we can see everything you do, and you know, whatever you do, don't do it in Dayton. Go to Kettering, which is the next town." <laughs> Have you ever had anybody that looked like there was a crime going on and turned out there wasn't? No, because we start from a reported crime, oh. so they'd have to report a false crime, which is in itself. A crime. Yes, ma'am. Um, Everybody is always, whatever system somebody has and is selling, they're always trying to improve it. So mm -hmm. what what things do you most want to improve in it? Do you, do you dream of more pixels or do you dream well, of... Well, the only reason we'd want to do, well, what we'd like to do is cover a larger area. Okay. Because the number of crimes we see is directly related to the size of the area we're watching. And the only thing that really torques you off, again, is when you see a major crime and you're following the person mm -hmm. and he gets out of the image before you can identify where he came from or where he went to, or, you know, track him past one of the ground-based cameras. Yes, ma'am. Is there any sort of public notice when you're going to filming? We work very hard. One of the things we do is we get with the communities. We have six or seven community meetings with Dayton. You know, we put it in the paper. There was, you know, all sorts of meetings. Personally, my goal is to reduce crime in a community. Mm -hmm. I'd like it as you drive in, it says, hey, you know, laws enforced in this community by airborne surveillance, not just the speed limits. And you know, I'd like the guy who's thinking about robbing the neighbor's house to walk outside and think about it and go, huh, maybe this isn't that good an idea. Right. But you also get the guy that's walking out to the labor protests, he's like, oh, the, employment. Well, someone once said that, you know, Walmart can Freedom of Information Act your information, write their own software, track their employees to the union meeting, figure out who it was, and then fire. And all I could think of is, you know, that sounds like a heck of a lot of work when they could hire a private investigator to sit outside of it with a long-range camera and take up close pictures. As far as the level of, of, of offenses that you track, mm -hmm. have you ever, I mean, how far down would you go? The how, lowest how, low were, how low and how low is too uncomfortable for you? The lowest investigation we've ever done was a strong-arm robbery <coughs> stealing the necklace of a grandmother in Compton. They had had a ration of necklace snatches. 
they thought it was a gang initiation, sort of a kid's prank internet type thing. And we followed the guy from the necklace snatch backwards, he got out of a car, we followed him forward, he got back into a car, so now it's not a localized neighborhood thing, it's a thing. We followed this car all the way across town, he also put five dollars worth of gas in his car at the Arco gas station where we have them on videotape there. Okay, would you do, would you do like a, a bar fight? You know, somebody just you know, hit somebody else in there? Um, we do typically would part you? one crimes. Would you? I mean, um, a bar case. fight if it's a assault with a deadly weapon, yes. Would you do it if it was speeding? No, well, we, we would not. Um, again, it would depend on the community's acceptance. In Dayton, our agreement is part one crimes only. Part one are the ones that they have to report to the FBI. Yes, the data storage? We build our own data storage. What if you get hacked? Um, I mean, we, one, they'd have to figure out where our servers are, two, how to do it. And being a hacker, I don't want to challenge you or anything. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I was more getting at is like, so with HIPAA, for example, you have to notify customers and such. Do you have any kind of accountability uh, policy in place? Well, what we have is I can tell you where every last one of my analysts looked. So I can, we can track the data to see where our analysts have looked to make sure that they're only looking at areas of reported investigated crimes. That way I can tell if the guy's looking at his girlfriend. I'm just trying to figure out where, where you draw the line. You wouldn't feel comfortable tracking somebody who's cheating on his spouse. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, but... Why? That's not what I built the system for. But what I will say is that what we do is we work with the communities that we work with. Mm -hmm. We develop a privacy policy. The biggest thing is telling my analyst what they're allowed and what they're not allowed to do. So that when the detective says, hey, can you look at this for me? The answer can come back no because we're not allowed to because our contract says these are the only things we're allowed to look at. No, your analyst could be tracking his girlfriend. Though. No, but, well, but I could see where he, everywhere that he's looked. So we actually record because of all the information stored on our central server, we can actually get. You have to request a location and a time it comes back, and we keep track of who asked for it, where they asked for, it, and the time that they asked. For it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you've talked about the fact that you can't see anyone's face, but you've also acknowledged that all you really need to know is where they went, really, and from there you can figure out who the suspects are. Because, you know, well, that works both ways. It works when you're tracking a suspect. It also works if you're using the system for abusive reasons, which I understand, you know, I, I, I'm all for solving crimes. So, right. so everybody here, I think, is yeah. good with that. And, and I think we're concerned about some of the potential abuses. And I understand. If you, you know, Who's watching? The, who's watching hard, the police it, department that's observing us watching? Right, and it's not hard to figure out where you know if you're just to throw out a crazy hypothetical. You know, you, you can probably figure out where a lot of the you know Muslims in your community live, right? And you can look at you know you can sing out those houses. You don't have 50 police officers to follow around your 50 Muslims, yeah. but you've got some system or you know aerial yeah. surveillance. You can put little red dots around them, yeah. and then the police department comes to you and says, "We have eight to ten crimes a day. We want the footage. Should we can look at?" Crimes. Yeah. So they have the footage, but what's to stop them from following the Muslims? I mean, I, I, the, so these are the kinds of abuses right. that we worry about, and they don't necessarily require I, you to see someone's face. And that's, I agree with that. And what we do, that's why we are working on all our privacy policies. We've put in some safeguards, and we're trying to work with the communities to make sure that we've addressed the realistic concerns. I mean, one of the things we've get, been asked to do is watch the known drug houses and companies. The first house we looked at, we saw 113 cars come and go in the first four hours. Now the person's on probation, it's an active, ongoing investigation, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. You know, that is, that's probably the only one that we've looked at there, it wasn't a, a ongoing 911. How do you respond to subpoenas? What's that? How do you respond to subpoenas? We respond. Here. You know, we'll set you down with an analyst, we'll set the defense attorney down with the analyst, show them this sort of thing, you know, here's where your client was arrested, here's where he came from, here he is loading up the truck and a car, here's the eyewitness coming and doing it, and usually the defense attorney is going to whack the guy upside the head and say, you idiot, you know? Have you ever fought a subpoena? What's that? Have you ever fought one? I don't see any reason to. Most of the time we don't have to. We've never really been subpoenaed. Mostly we've just provided information to folks who then go off, and they, there's usually a wealth of other information that's in there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm interested in the terms of the privacy agreements that you have with the cities, other than how long you're storing data. Gotcha. And I'm also interested in any, how you characterize the changes you've made to your privacy practices as you've 
gone through this process of getting okay. feedback from experts and communities. Okay. Two seconds to discover a little bit. One, there's a lot of other uses. Major event security, uh, emergency response. Here's the Iowa floods. We covered the entire flooded area of Iowa in about two hours, and we're looking for people stuck on rooftops. Here's uh, Hurricane Sandy we did. Uh, privacy and regulatory requirements. First of all, we are primarily designed to be used by local law enforcement. We do very little work for the U.S. government other than border protection and other sorts of stuff, um, and stuff overseas, but that's a different story. Um, we have been reviewed by multiple city attorneys who put us in the same category as any police helicopter or any airborne law enforcement asset. And essentially, if you're walking out in public view, there's two Supreme Court level decisions. One that I don't necessarily agree with that says from 400 feet I can look through the missing panes in your greenhouse, see that you're growing dope, and use that as a search warrant. And that was out of Florida. Um, there's other things. We have what we consider to be fairly robust privacy policies and oh by the way it's very important that we follow them because our business depends on it. Our goal is to basically serve the needs of the community for supporting crime and we don't want to get it up. Um, we strictly support the local developed policies and we work with that. Um, we, I'm not going to go into too much of the details here but the, one of the big aspects that does give some people comfort is that the resolution is limited by technology and also by design. Even if I had a factor of 10 more pixels, I still couldn't tell who a person was. I probably can't tell you what color shirt they're wearing. I definitely can't tell you whether or not they're red, green, yellow, black, purple, whether or not they're gay or straight, or whatever else, it doesn't matter. And oh, by the way, that also means I covered one ninth of the area that I'd like to cover, and I'd see one ninth the number of crimes. Are you using uh, night vision or are they any other advanced imaging? Um, kind of we we sometimes add a higher resolution camera ball because the law enforcement wants it, and it is got a nighttime capability. And we do have an infrared capability that we developed for the military a long time ago, um, but we are not currently using that over any cities. But presumably the demand will be there. I mean, for one thing, if this if this system becomes widely adopted and people know that it's widely adopted, there will just be a shift of crime to night. Right? Yes. All those kids that you want brought in by the date, you know, they're going to say, oh, I guess I better do my muggings at night well, or in cloudy days. We will make sure we tell them that at night we can follow headlights and taillights, but you're right. If I sh Right now, 65 to 70 percent of crime occurs during the day, about 30, 20, 30 to 35 percent occurs at night. Yes, sir. Um, it seems like, I mean, you said that everything is done again. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like many of the, what you're describing are things that sound like patterns that could be automated. You know, I mean, it, where you know, even if your accuracy wasn't as good, uh -huh. your volume would go up, uh -huh. right? You know, it's like anytime somebody scatters, that's a that's a, a point of interest. Right. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a question so much as. Let, let, me, let, me, let me take a stab at answering it real quick. The Air Force has spent over a billion dollars trying to build systems and automated systems similar to this and automated tracking systems, and they've failed miserably. So why is it so hard? Um, because the resolution and the frame rate, doesn't, you don't have enough information to accurately track them. Your frame rate is one a second? One per second. So the technology is not there, and to be honest with you, at my company level, it's not, I mean, we invest in $10 analysts, $10 an hour, $15 an hour analysts, and I can put a thousand of them out there as opposed to the money that they've spent on building, trying to build automated tools to track cars automatically, which, oh, by the way, miss it when people get out of the car, miss it when it does a car-to-car -car meeting, and only works for about 10 to 15 seconds at a time, despite the large amount of money they've spent trying to do it. Why, if you don't mind one follow up, what's your false positive rate look like? I mean, how many times do you get one of these and you say, boy, that looked like uh, that looked like that car was involved, but it turns out after investigation that they just took off because they saw a crime being committed and were scared crap. <laughs> well, interestingly, the murder I showed you there, there was one car that appeared to stumble into the murder seconds before the murder occurred. He had no relationship to the other cars that are associated there. He looks like a cab driver driving around looking for an address. And we sort of discounted him because he was not involved with the other four vehicles that were directly involved. 
or the other eight vehicles that those guys met with involved in that. So you actually believe, you know, when you watch someone, you can determine, you get a, a sense of what they're doing. In that case, we dismissed him, even though he was at the murder scene less than 30 seconds prior to the shooting, pulls right in, backs up, and goes the other way. We didn't see any connection. So the answer is we can often get, in some cases, the ability to say, no, I don't think that person was involved, right, and here's why. But it's, I mean, we're not, we're just showing the imagery. It's not, you know, we're not doing a whole lot of interpretation based on that. Yes, sir. How long do you think it will be before the date police get an email from a competitor of yours of the cheaper services at the IMS in India and China? Um, <laughs> our, our system, I mean, to be honest with you right now, all my competitors that do this for the military that charge 30 to 40, US yeah, oh. that charge 30 to 40 times what we do, because... Didn't ask about the U.S. military, sorry, ask about well, the other Well, right now we're an order of magnitude by design cheaper than the next closest person. Congress. Yeah, uh, anyone who does this. We're the only, I mean, we keep track of who does this sort of stuff. and. And we're right now well out in front in the technology, the price side of it. So what is the approximate price for safety? Uh, we do, we, our government rate is about $1,900 an hour for a full service, which is about the price of a police helicopter per hour. Is so any error? Uh, assessed. So, um, someone asked what we did with the community. Here's some of the stuff we've done with the community. So we've engaged the National ACLU, which some people thought it was absolutely nuts to go in and talk to them. I said, why are you doing that? And actually we got some really good feedback. We've talked to the date of the Ohio ACLU and a whole bunch of other people. Some people don't want to participate with us because they want to save the right to sue us later. And you know, here we are. So this is what we're trying to do. And again, I've got a sign up sheet here. If anyone wants to be on the mailing list and participate in this, we, we, this is a sample of the uh, of a police department's thing. It basically defines what these are, what part one crimes are, and other sorts of stuff. And it basically says, hey, this is, these are the terms of what we will use it for, how we will use it, when it's allowed to be used, and oh, by the way, when it's not allowed to be used. So our agreement with Dayton would be that we're not allowed to see any protests or anything like that. It just tells my analyst that if someone were to ask them to follow someone from there, we can say no. <laughs> and yes. with that, I think we're pretty much out of time. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you know, I think that there's two major issues here, really. One is what uh, Ross and his company is doing, and I definitely appreciate you, you know, being willing to engage with the privacy community and, and, uh, and uh, so forth. And the other issue is you know, where this <laughs> industry goes as a whole. Um, you know, the gentleman asked about competitors, where the technology goes, where the industry goes, where we go as a country, not just you know, 18 months from now, but but uh, 10, 20 years from now, and uh, this this is uh, this is where the rubber hits the, hits the road. Do we want to become a surveillance? You know, uh, to what extent are we going to allow surveillance uh, like this in our society? So, thank you, thank you so much for coming in and uh, feeling your questions and presenting. Thank you. I thought it was important. To